Nay. Um, this is me, and I'm going to be your moderator this evening. So I wanted to just introduce myself before I hand it off to Mr. Keeles. I want to remind uh, the participants to be sure to not use the chat box. I'm going to go in and take care of that right now to use the Q&A as that's where I'll be looking for the questions to be able to give to Mr. Keeles to answer. And thank you for all being here this evening, Mr. Keeles. Thank you, Mrs. Mean. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Heath Keeles. I'm the principal here at Avery Park High School. I think most of you probably know me by now. Um, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, I know that the district has asked for families to make a decision um, over the next day or so with regards to um, whether or not you will be returning to our hybrid instructional program here at the high school or whether you might instead be interested in participating in a 100% virtual program. Um, so tonight, I'd like to answer as many questions as I possibly can um, so that you're able to make the best decision that you can for the well-being um, of your family and, uh, and of, you know, basically what you'd like to do. Um, at various points this evening, um, we also have with us tonight our athletic director, Mr. Bubniak, and we will be joined by um, Dr. Harrelson, our Director of Special Education. So if we have any questions that come to us from those particular areas, uh, those folks will be jumping in to help out as well. Um, again, throughout the course of the evening, I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, there are still many things that are questions and that are not necessarily ready for us to answer yet. However, we're going to do our best because we'd like to make sure you have the information you need to make the decisions that you need to. So, Mrs. Mean, if you've got questions, I guess we'll get started. Excellent. I do, sir. All right. So the first question for tonight is, how will students who are sent home pending a negative COVID test be handled with keeping up with the in-person learning? So one of the interesting components of the hybrid model is that our students who are participating in the hybrid model um, will already have a remote relationship with each of their teachers from the days that they are not instruction in the in in-person instruction so you know i would visualize that as we kind of move into this model if there are students who need to go home for a period of time um, either because they're waiting for test results or because they need to be quarantined for one of a million other different reasons at any given point in time um, that we would be able to maintain that instructional relationship using the remote connection that students have been using on their off days um, i would see it as something that we would we would do very similar to when a student is sick normally um, you know the student would be able to connect with their teacher um, teachers would be able to provide students with work that they can be doing at home um, the added bonus here um, is that we have a remote connection that's been established from those off days so we continue to leverage that and be able to take care of that student's needs while they're home Our next question addresses our accelerated students. If honors classes are not available for virtual learning, what will happen for kids on an accelerated track in math and or science that have chosen the virtual option? That has been a great question. Um, <laughs> it's been one that I've answered uh, many times just via email with folks um, since we first brought it up at last week's presentation. That is going to be perhaps one of our biggest challenges for students who go into remote learning. Um, there is absolutely no question that we are going to do the best that we can to match students' schedules to what they would have intended to have had. Um, however, I completely anticipate that students will have to make new choices and decisions. Um, so that said, if a student isn't able to participate in the accelerated types of coursework that they typically would have in the building, um, when students transition back in, we're going to need to make sure that we create opportunities for kids to get back into those programs that they had been in previously. That said, um, we are going to leverage all of the existing staff that we have, as well as APEX, which is an online learning plat platform, to try our best to offer options for students in 100% virtual learning to be able to access the same kinds of coursework that they would have when they were in school. Um, again, it's going to be a bit of a challenge 
And one of the biggest challenges right now is knowing how many students are actually going to opt to do that 100% virtual program. Um, you know, our ability to, to take care of 100 different trajectories of program and different kinds of student schedules um, for 25 students will look incredibly different than if it's 125. Um, so our big next step at the high school is really to find out how many students are participating in the 100% virtual program so that we are able to then go back and look through everything we've got from a human resource perspective, from teachers, from sections, to be able to do what we can to meet each student's needs. But I do want to be clear that I do not suspect that if there are a large number of students doing virtual, 100% virtual learning, that all students will get the courses that they selected um, in their original course selection process. Excellent. And along the uh, same lines with accelerated students, and this might transcend into just general virtual learning versus the hybrid in person. If students who are in accelerated classes and programs, i.e. ninth grade taking Algebra 2, if they chose a virtual learning platform instead of in person, will they still receive the same classwork content curriculum and opportunities as their peers that opted for in person? So some of that I believe you addressed it. It's just the content and curriculum and classwork, I think. No, absolutely. And that's a really good extension to the question um, because it helps us get into a little bit of how we might address some of those, those issues. Um, you know, for some students, it may be that a teacher in that content area is available within our master schedule to provide a, a very, very similar course that could run very, current, very uh, concurrently to what it is that students are doing in school. If we do not have access to that kind of a teacher in that content area um, at a point in time, we might have to use an APEX or an online option, um, in which case the content may look a little bit different. We are, however, able to, um, to select very specific modules within each of those online courses. So we will be working with each of our content area specialists to try to align those, those courses in such a way that when a student transitions back, um, the transition would be easier rather than harder. Um, but again, you know, we have to get back to you know, that whole point of knowing how many students we're doing this for so that we can really take the time to, to see what we're able to support kids in as they move into this. Thank you, Mr. Keyways. Uh, looking ahead a little bit more towards the winter here, the next question is asking, how would a snow day affect the AABB schedule? Well, that one is a little bit easier. <laughs> <I like that. laughs> No, that's one of those sort of concrete things. So we did build the AABB day schedule in such a way that once we release it to everyone, it will be a lock in. So you will be able to plan that the days that you see, which are A for cohort one and A for cohort two, all the way throughout the 2021 school year are the days that we would continue to have. Um, so that schedule would be sent out to everyone. It would be a lock-in, and it would be something that you could um, you could count on not changing, regardless of snow days. Um, I would want to make the point that in the bigger picture of things, that AABB day rotation schedule is designed for our hybrid model, and it's designed for um, for essentially any in-person model. If for some reason um, we needed to move to remote instruction for our entire program because numbers went up or something like that, we would revert back to an A day, B day schedule. So at the opening of the school year, we would intend to share out two potential rotations. One is the AABB calendar for the entire year, um, and that would support the model that we're going into. And the second is a calendar with a traditional A, B rotation so that folks could have a picture of and plan ahead for if we needed to remove ourselves into total remote instruction for everyone. Our next question goes along the lines you just addressed the splits with the students. So the next question addresses that. Are kids attending school based on the name alphabetically? So kids of all grades would be grouped together in the same classes and kids would get their lessons through Chromebooks or will kids be grouped together in classes by grades 
and being taught lessons face to face while in the school building. So our students um, at the high school are basically going to be broken into two cohorts. There's the A through K and the L through Z cohorts. Um, so students will attend school um, based on their last name um, using those alphabet configurations. Who students attend class with really depends on their course selections. There's, there's no really typical sort of trajectory through the schedule. Um, so students selected their courses in the spring. Um, every course that students have selected has have been scheduled. Um, they've been sections. Uh, students will be in traditional sections. The only difference is that when that particular class meets on a particular student's day um, that they're in person, the only students who will be in person with them are the students who share their alphabetical cohort, um, while the other cohort would be home and then reverse. So again, we are cohorting by alphabet. It's A through K and then L through Z. And students would attend the classes that they selected with students with similar last names. Along those lines, seeing the uh, hybrid is based on course selections, this next question has to do with electives. So with all of the original, will all the original electives still be available in the hybrid scenario for students to learn versus virtual learning, or will there be a modified selection of electives? In the hybrid model, we are offering absolutely every course and every section and every piece of program that we um, offer during, you know, any of our traditional programming. So all of our courses will be offered, um, all of our electives, all of our art programs, all of our load programs, all of our music programs, all of our technology programs, um, you know, absolutely every department and every course that we offered in our course catalog in the spring is able to be delivered in our building with existing staff in the hybrid model. Dovetail with that, with the electives, if a high schooler opted to participate in a group-based elective, for instance, band, orchestra, chorus, theater, would they still be able to participate in these in a virtual learning environment? We are hoping so. Um, this kind of connects to, I think, some of the first questions Earlier. that we yeah. kind of brought up. Um, there's absolutely no question. You know, we are absolutely going to do our best, you know, in all of these cases to try to accommodate as many of our students' course selections as we possibly can. Um, you know, for those who are in virtual, 100% um, virtual coming up into the upcoming year. Um, a lot of it, honestly, is going to come down to when we know the number of students that we're working with taking each case, sitting down with each student's counselor, looking at each student's course uh, schedule and course selections, and then seeing course by course what kinds of things we can do to support that student continuing to take that course um, with the existing resources that we have. Um, I, I again want to kind of balance two messages. We, the first is that we are going to absolutely do our best. Um, and, and the second is that it is, however, likely that students will have to make some choices and it is very possible that in 100% virtual, the student may not get all of the courses from their course selection. Excellent. The next one starts out with a compliment. I wanna share that with you first. So thank you for all of your hard work and time that you've been putting in to ensure a successful school year. The question goes back to our very first question about the COVID testing it almost backdrops to that, which would be, what will the procedure be for if a student was to become ill during the school day itself? No, that's a very good question. Um, you know, our nurses and our nursing staff, uh, our directors of nursing specifically, uh, Val Miller, who many of you know, and, um, you know, they've been working very hard to put together protocols for how we are going to be responding to those kinds of situations in the building. Um, you know, just so folks know, we will be having, um, as I believe is very clearly stated in our plan and in the regulations, we'll be having an isolation room that will be available here in the high school. Um, so we'll have prot protocols in place that when a student um, may become ill or show any symptoms that we're concerned about, um, specifically that our nurses are concerned about, uh, which may be COVID or could even be COVID related, um, students will be um, going to an isolation room um, they'll be under the supervision of our nurse and we'll be contacting parents for assistance so that we can move forward with that. Um, 
but our nursing staff has been working really hard and they have excellent protocols to make sure that we're able to address those situations appropriately. The next one is definitely for you, Mr. Kiles, and possibly you, Mr. Bugniak, as well. If a student chooses in school, will they still be doing phys ed with changing, et cetera, or will they be able to fulfill it in another way at school, as well as how would um, PE be fulfilled if they chose to work virtually at home? So I guess the first part of that question is here in school, in the hybrid model, um, our PE classes are going to be, um, and, and Mr. Bubniak may jump in afterwards if he wants to, to, to be more specific to the content area, but they're going to be kind of like PE light in the sense that they're going to focus on um, lifetime activities. Um, we are not going to have students changing or using the locker rooms for um, getting ready for PE. So students will be able to participate in their uh, phys ed class in the clothes that they wear at school. Um, keep in mind that the class sizes are going to be about half of what they have typically been. So each section will be 10 to 12 students. Um, our teachers are going to be focusing a great deal on doing activities outside as long as we possibly can and as long as the weather sustains the ability to do that. Um, so it will be a good opportunity for lifetime fitness skills, um, for lifetime, uh, for you know, just general fitness activities. Um, and again, a nice opportunity to get outside. No changing, no locker rooms. We are not going to open the air with any of, uh, of those kinds of things happening for PE. Excellent. All right, the next two I will put them together um, address freshmen specifically. So the first part of that would be what can a freshman expect on their first day at school if they don't know what they don't know yet? <laughs> and the second piece of that is probably going to be part of your answer, I would expect, which is, will the high school still hold an annual event for the incoming freshmen and their families in, in advance of the school year to receive their schedules and tour the building, find their classrooms, all those traditional things that we've held? That's a good question. And Mrs. Mean, you know the answer because we <laughs> talked about that today. No, yes, um, we are going to- We've been working to, on it. <laughs> yeah, we have. No, we are actually, we are going to offer a virtual orientation program for all of our incoming um, ninth graders. So we'll be doing that um, in the time frame of the last week of August. So we'll be sending out the final dates and information about that um, very, very soon. But in addition to that, we're looking at setting up some um, optional small group tours of the building as well um, during some of the, our superintendent conference days when the building is open and set up and ready. So those would be opportunities for students if they wanted to, if they felt comfortable to sign up to come in in small groups and tour the building um, with an upper class student who would be able to kind of show you around, show you the ropes, um, and just kind of give you a sense of what the high school looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So we will have a virtual orientation for our incoming ninth grade, and we will have the opportunity for people to be able to come in and do small group, socially distanced um, tours with upper class students as well. The next two uh, deal with Questar specifically. So I'll put those together as well. So will transportation still be provided to and from the Questar programming? And to follow with that, what would a junior schedule look like? Again, because they haven't gone before, what is, what's a schedule gonna look like for a student going to Questar in their first year? In the, so in, Questar the is model. for the hybrid model. Well, Questar is, hybrid. okay. So Questar is running all of its programs. Um, so students will absolutely, if you're signed up and you're in a Questar program, you're going to have access to their programs. Their programs are actually running every single day um, because they're much smaller programs. So students who are Questar students um, at Avril Park High School will have access to their Questar, the Questar portion of their program each and every day. Um, we will provide transportation um, for students to attend Questar just like we have in the past for our hybrid students. Um, however, there is the potential that if you are an afternoon Questar person um, and it is your remote day, if you do not have your own transportation at the midday point to go to Questar, we may be asking for you to come into the building and we will have set up locations where you will be able to be for the morning so that you're able to catch that midday Questar bus 
that goes out um, around lunchtime. So we'll have our normal transportation in the morning, our normal transportation in the afternoon. We'll have all of our Questar bus runs to and from the high school at their appropriate times in the morning, midday, and at the end of the day. Um, but it is possible that if you're a student, for example, like I said, who has Questar in the afternoon, that on your remote day, if you are not a self, self-transport self person for Questar, that we'd have you come in and we'd um, give you a place to be to do work or to engage in the different activities um, for the morning portion until your Questar bus left. Excellent. This kind of goes back to an earlier question regarding accelerated students. Uh, this parent asked, a similar question in the middle school session and they're wondering if it's going to be different at the high school. If a student starts in the online only program, so they start with virtual learning and potentially they're not able to take honors classes, but then after the first quarter switch to a hybrid program, would they be able to get back into those honor classes? Basically, will there be an opportunity to get back into honors courses the following year as well so they don't lose that opportunity? Yeah, no, the objective would be to do whatever we could to make sure that we could get students back on track with those um, particular courses that they were in. Um, so if a student is accelerated or if a student is in honors um, and started off in virtual um, and then came back, we would do whatever we could. Um, again, a big part of that answer is going to depend on how we resolve the issue of how we are going to maintain program for you while you are in the 100% virtual. Uh, component of our program. Um, and so kind of once we know what that looks like and how, how similar we are able to match the content and the pace of those particular courses, that's going to inform, you know, whether we can make that transition happen. Um, but I think the default answer in my mind's eye has got to be that we will do our best to make sure that kids can get back into those kinds of courses and continue on their pathway to whatever it was that they were doing for graduation. One deals with uh, our weather again. <laughs> Going back to an earlier one as well with the snow day question. How are the uh, planned outdoor spaces going to be utilized during winter and inclement weather? The messaging so far has been outdoor spaces will be available. How is it going to be planned for with the inclement weather? Right. No, the outdoor spaces, um, and we've got about 10 to 12 of them here at the high school. Um, the outdoor spaces are really only going to be able to be used in the hybrid model when the weather is appropriate for students to be outside. Um, you know, I did have one person reach out and say, you know, geez, I would feel very uncomfortable if I weren't able to have access to a safe outdoor space. Um, and one of the things that I, I want to make really clear is that all of our classrooms in the hybrid model and in the way that we're setting this up are safe instructional spaces. Um, so all of the rooms as they're functioning are safe instructional spaces. Um, our outdoor spaces are the icing on the cake. You know, they are a way that we can help to diversify, um, you know, how we spread folks out. It's a way for us to be able to give students an opportunity to take mask breaks to kind of change up what instruction looks like. Um, you know, they are the above and beyond what we're already being able to provide as safe spaces for instruction in our building. So they will be available when the weather is appropriate, um, when the uh, modality of instruction that a particular teacher is using on a given day kind of fits going outside. Um, you know, keeping in mind that if it's a day where you're using technology or it's raining or you know, the modality of instruction doesn't really fit going outside because students might be, not be able to hear each other or communicate well then the answer is that we would stick with our indoor instructional spaces for those days. The next two, I'll give them to you one at a time, but they have to do with safety. Um, the first question is, how will student safety be ensured when they have to wait in front of the school to enter? So what's the entrance process going to look like? Then I'll give you the next one that's on the safety after you've done with this one. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> I'm always fearful that I'm, I'm answering the first part of the question and then forgetting the second. So thanks. <laughs> All right. So in the morning, um, I don't necessarily expect that students on the bus end of the entrance area are going to need to be waiting outside in any way, shape or form. Um, our plan at this moment is that as buses arrive to the high school in the morning, they will be staggering to two different locations. So one bus will arrive and go to the um, atrium. The other bus will arrive and go to the athletic entrance. Um, the students who are on that bus will get off the bus. They will go through a temperature screening area in each of those respective entrances. 
Um, and when that bus is complete, we will then bring up the next set, a set of two buses. So we're really only dealing with small populations of students at any one given time as they're going through those, um, those potentially bottleneck sorts of areas. So we've got that under control. On the front end of the building, um, we will have two um, entrances as well. We'll have our main entrance um, to the high school and we'll have the entrance down by the parent drop-off in our music wing. So as students who are self-drivers or who are getting dropped off are arriving to school, those students will be coming in. Um, we actually did the placement today of where we're going to put the screening materials in the building um, and we have them set up in such a way that we're able to bring students inside um, each of those initial areas and have them safely be social distanced while we're doing the screening process so that students don't have to be outside in inclement weather. Um, so again, we'll be controlling the number of students that come through those points um, at, at a given point in time. Um, in the hybrid model, we've got about 420 students coming to school. We have four different entrances that students will be using. Um, and, you know, on an average, each of those entrances will take in about 100, 125 students um, over the course of a 30 minute um, arrival process. So, you know, we um, are very confident that those will not become bottlenecked um, and we're confident that we're able to manage that very safely. Mm -hmm. um, also keep in mind that in the hybrid bell schedule, um, we have built in 19 extra minutes in the beginning of the day as flex time. So that will really allow us to make sure that we kind of get students in, um, that they have time to get their breakfast and report to their first block classes. Um, so I, we may not wind up using, needing to use all that time, in which case there's some other things that we could creatively get back into our day um, at a later point in the year. Uh, the second piece of the safety question would be, how will lockdowns and fire drills be executed? That's a great question as well. Um, so in terms of uh, our fire drills, we've had more conversations around those. Um, the high school is, is in right now in the process of being color coded by zone. So we've created five distinct zones throughout the building. They're all color coded zones. We'll be using this zoned system to help with anything that we need to stagger the movement of our student population around. Um, so, for example, we'll be starting the school year off with a slightly minute, minute by minute staggered dismissal by zone. Um, we will also be using the color coded system um, of zoning for addressing fire drills. So our regulations have indicated that we're able to do zoned or staggered fire drills as long as the entire population of the school occurs on the same day. So we'll be doing a number of small group fire drills throughout the course of a given day in order to safely and in a socially distanced manner um, kind of address what fire drills will look at look like. Um, with regards to lockdowns, I'm going to say that I think we really need a little bit more uh, information from our safety folks at Questar in our regional BOCES. Um, we're just starting to dig into what lockdown drills might look like. Um, we hit the fire drills first, and I think second, we'll have to take a look at lockdowns. So more to come on that one. Next question fits into the uh, safety arena somewhat. It's dealing with masks and uh, water bottles. Will students be allowed to use their water bottles as it will require a student to move, adjust, or remove their mask to drink? The question is, will students be allowed to use their water bottle? Oh, yes. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> students will be able to use their water bottles. Um, you know, as you think about it, what we're really looking at is while we're going to require that all students and staff wear masks while they're here in the building, um, there is also the component that, you know, if folks are appropriately socially distanced within any given environment, there's definitely room for students to be able to pull down a mask and have a drink from their water bottle. There's absolutely no question. Um, so students will have, you know, the ability to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> without question. Um, <laughs> You know, and we're also thinking a great deal about um, things like mask, mask breaks um, and, you know, how we're able to give students an opportunity to kind of take a break from having a mask on in a way that's safe. Um, so we're creating some general guidelines for our teachers on how mask breaks might look in a classroom environment, um, but we'll also be offering students those opportunities in some of our um, outdoor spaces, certainly during lunch. Um, but today we were actually, and Mrs. Mead knows this, we were working on some general 
guidelines and uh, protocols for teachers uh, around how you can appropriately do mask breaks in the classroom and remain um, socially distanced and safe. The next question has to deal with transitioning from models. So if a family chooses to do virtual, virtual learning to start and realizes four to five weeks into that option that it's not working for their child, is there an option for a student to switch to hybrid before the quarter would end? We are aiming for folks to commit for a quarter um, because again, that's a natural transition in terms of marking periods, in terms of our sections, in terms of grading. Um, so we would want for folks to commit to a quarter and, you know, again, that would give everyone an opportunity to be able to plan accordingly on both ends, um, especially on, you know, the end of being able to accommodate the students who are coming back and, you know, knowing what we need to do and having some time to make sure we do it well. Um, again, that's going to also give us time to be able to develop what we need to in terms of plans to address all of those little transition needs that folks have brought up with regards to getting into courses that are similar to what you selected in your original schedule. Um, the more lead time we have with that stuff, the better job I know we can do. Um, so we are asking for folks to make commitments by the marking period and quarter. Um, and I think that for us, that's November 13th is the first marking period um, at the high school. Transitions. This question goes to one we haven't talked about a whole lot, which is what is the plan for ending the hybrid model and getting back to 100% full time for all students together? <laughs> well, the good news, uh, from whatever perspective it might be, because I don't know if it's good news for everybody, the good news was we had to submit a plan for all three models to state ed. Um, so with that said, we do have a, um, a plan for being a 100% in-person program while still maintaining social distancing. So for us, we, um, we have a plan for that. It would really be actually, um, you know, not too big from the instructional uh, components because, you know, from a student end of things, you know, you basically stop going to school every other day and you'd start going to school every day. You'd still be, um, you know, uh, you'd still be going to the classes that you went to before it, you'd just be doing it every day. Um, from a building end, uh, one of the things that is important to know is that if we do go into that, into that modality, which at some point we will need to make that transition, um, there are some physical shifts within the building that we would need to make in order to make sure that um, we were providing appropriate social distancing. So when we do transition back to 100% in person, with social distancing, all of our classroom spaces would be used all of the time. Um, our PE areas would be used for classes. Um, our gyms would be used, our LGI. Um, we'd be using all of our spaces in very different ways, but we would be delivering the exact same program that we were delivering in the hybrid model. Um, so it's all the same program. It's just a shift of how we use space throughout the building. And I have a couple questions that are special ed related. So I'll give you a break for a moment, Mr. Keeles. <laughs> you can grab some water. Uh, is Camille on? I can see questions, so I can only see part of you. So Camille, are you here? here. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So the first question for you, Camille, is my son is in the special ed program. Are they going to be attending every day or every other day like the rest of the school? So the way we are programming for our students with disabilities is um, if you are a, have a child that's in our 12 on one self-contained program, our intent is to have those students come on a daily basis. And that's simply because the level of programs and services that those students need, along with related services, are um, for more developmentally delayed students. Um, where our integrated, I'm sorry, where our consult teacher services and our 15 to ones and our resource rooms would be um, lockstep with the rest of the high school and they would um, be on that um, rotational schedule. And um, students would still get all the services that are on their IEP. Um, if there is an, a chance that the services might be changed at all, there will be um, open communication between the case manager, the CSE office and the family to kind of collaborate um, and discuss what the change may be uh, that would impact our child. 
Excellent. And speaking of services, <laughs> good transition, Camille. Will students with IEPs have their resource room block when they do have that block? Would they be allowed during this time to visit other teachers for extra help if those teachers were available during that same time frame? Hmm. That's actually a really good question. Um, at this point, I think what we're trying to do is wait until the survey results, get, we get that um, information back to really find out how many students we have that will be attending our programming. And then what we would want to do is ensure the safety of our students with transitioning within the hallways and from one classroom to another. To another. So that would be, again, some discussion points to have with the special education staff at the high school and get their feedback and along with um, the high school administration to make sure that we're ensuring the safety of our students but yet meeting their needs educationally. Excellent, thank you. And we're going to switch over to Mr. Bubniak. <laughs> I have one for you, Mr. Bubniak. Sure. Will students that choose 100% virtual option be allowed to play sports if they reopen and reinstitute sports being able to be played? I like that question because that's one of the few questions I actually have an answer to. Uh, yeah, yesterday uh, we received guidance from the State Education Department that uh, students that do cho choose the 100% virtual uh, would still be able to participate in athletics if we were able to have athletics uh, in some fashion this year. As of now, we, for fall sports, we have a September 21st uh, start date. Um, that's subject to change and I believe will change probably. I don't know if your fall season will be uh, looking like it normally does. There may be certain sports that we can run um, those that you can more socially distance in than others. Um, and then some other traditional fall sports, they may get moved to a different part of the year um, if, if we're able to do that. So September 21st is the start date right now. And just a heads up for those of you that uh, want to sign, sign up your uh, son or daughter for fall sports, uh, that's going to start on Family ID from August 24th until September 6th. And obviously, if that start date of September 21st changes for any reason, uh, we would adjust those uh, registration dates as well. I'd look for those communications out on social media and things like that from you. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Bognak. Back to Mr. Kiles. <laughs> All right. So when students are outdoors, when using outdoor classrooms, how would potential active attacks be guarded against. So how would you protect students when working outdoors is the question. We are going to use the same exact safety protocols that we've always used for teachers who have taken their students outside. Um, however, we're going to kind of uh, build them up a little bit. So the base here is that we have uh, 10 to 12 different outdoor locations that have been identified that teachers can sign up to use. Um, we will be asking that our teachers sign out those locations so that we know at all times where all of our students are and where each section of the class is. Um, and then in addition to that, we um, want to make sure that we have a communication mechanism between that group and the building. So we'll be looking at using cell phones and radios, which we already have here in place, to ensure that um, we're able to communicate just like we would in a classroom with um, students and their teachers who might be outside, um, and that they're able to communicate with us. Um, so again, same protocols as, as usual, but we're going to kind of bump them up and take them up to another level. So again, sign out sheet, accountability. We need to know where these groups are. You sign out your location, you be in that location. And then the final piece is having active communication with each of those groups. Along the same vein, another question, because students will not be able to use their lockers this year, what's the plan to ensure that students don't conceal weapons in their backpacks or coats with not being able to use lockers? Those are really the same protocols that we've always had. Um, you know, during even any, any given year, um, we certainly have never been a, as a, a district or a high school who has need to, needed to do across the board screening of any kind. Um, but, it, you know, what we do do is if there is any kind of issue which emerges or somebody is concerned about a particular student or something that they saw, or if a student sees something that is of concern to them, um, you know, the district 
building, or sorry, the building leadership teams going to follow up, investigate, to, you know, make sure that we you know, do due diligence in order to ensure that, you know, there isn't a danger to anyone. Um, so it's the same protocols as we typically would have for ensuring, um, you know, a safe school at any point in time. You know, whether students were to have had something in their locker or in their backpacks, it's, it's the same protocols as we've always had. Protocols and see something, say something. Everything we've been doing. Yep. I think a few folks may have joined us mid stride. Um, so I do have a couple of times this has been repeatedly asked. So if you don't mind revisiting, <laughs> how a student would uh, receive PE credit if they choose the 100% virtual modality? I had noise on this end. You cut out. Can you just repeat that one yes. more time? Thank you. How will students that choose the 100% virtual choice get PE credit? So specifically. Okay. That's a good question. And you know what? Now that you're saying that, that was a second part to a question that I don't think I even got a chance to answer. So thank you to whoever asked that question. Um, if you are doing 100% virtual, um, we are probably going to be setting you up the same way we did for students who are on home instruction in the past. Um, so you're likely going to get a series of assignments that you're going to be doing online um, with different activities and logs of your activities and different modalities of, um, or different learning modules around lifetime activities and health education. Um, so you'll be working remotely through online programs that are connected and supervised by our PE teachers um, in the same way that we typically have done remote learning for PE. Excellent. This one's a scheduling question that is a 612 question. So does the high school schedule coincide with the middle school schedule? For example, same days at school versus working from home if two kids are in one family, one's at the middle school, one's at the high school? Yes, the answer is that they do. Um, Mr. Messi and I worked very hard to kind of plan these structures and these schedules so that, um, you know, if you are a family with somebody in the middle school and at the high school, um, you know, your children will be going to school on the same days. Um, the modality of instruction that they attend on a given day should be exactly the same. Um, we're following the same rotation schedules. Um, so we are consistent between the middle school and the high school for that, for our different families. Excellent. And this is along the same lines with the AABB schedule. I know you spoke about it earlier a little bit, but um, some folks are finding it confusing having the AABB. Are students at school two days, then home two days? How's that AABB work? Okay, so the AABB day schedule is one in which you still attend school, any given person attends school every other day. So you're not home two days in a row. So there's four different kinds of days in the AABB schedule. There's the A day when cohort one comes to school and cohort two stays home. Then there's the A day again, but we reverse it and cohort two comes to school and cohort one is at home doing remote learning, right? Then we do a B day with cohort one in person and cohort two remotely. And then we do another B day with cohort two in person and cohort one remotely. So it's four different kinds of days. It's every other day for every student. Um, and again, I really wanna push that it's new instruction every day, whether you're on the remote end or whether you are here in the building doing the in-person day. Um, so we are working to make sure that every single day, whether you're here or at home on remote, that students are engaging in new instruction in each of their classes in a structured way. This question, the next question has to deal with live streaming. So in the hybrid model, will classroom teaching be streamed live for days that the students aren't in the classroom, meaning when they're working virtually from home? So we are going to provide all of our teachers with the capability to um, be able to do live streaming um, within each of our classrooms and within each of our, our courses. Um, we are not expecting that every teacher is going to live stream every single course and every single section. Um, we are finding as we talk with our teacher leaders, as we talk with our teachers within each content area, that there are a lot of very different and unique ways that we um, are seeing folks wanting to use that technology. Some folks want to do live streaming. Some folks are going to record sessions that people can use on their 
um, on their remote days. Um, other folks are looking at having their in-person class and their remote class together for the first couple of minutes, um, one remotely and one in person, to kind of set out the objectives for the next upcoming block, to send students off on different trajectories in terms of work they're going to do over the next 40 minutes, and then perhaps come back together virtually and in person to kind of synthesize that information. Um, so live streaming will be a component of how we address the hybrid model for um, the upcoming year, but it will not be what everybody's doing all of the time. Uh, this next question deals with support. So how can parents best support the teachers and staff during this time? That's a great question. <laughs> I want to say that I, I think that I think the biggest thing, and this is very broad, but the biggest thing that we can all be doing is, um, you know, really just continuing to take really good care of one another, um, to be, you know, to understand that this is definitely not a situation that any of anyone in our school community um, expected to or wanted to be in, you know, over the past six months. So I really think that the best thing that we can do as a school community is, you know, stick together, make sure that we're communicating, make sure that we're taking good care of one another. Um, and from a parent end of things, you know, certainly communicate and, and let us know what's working and what's not working because the truth is that all of this is a tremendous, tremendous work in progress. Um, and, you know, people are, are, are working very hard to kind of change the, the model of how we deliver education. Um, and, you know, I know that we're going to do a great job with this, but I know that it's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take some adjustment on everybody's end. So I think patience and communication and letting us know what's working and what's not working. Um, and certainly, you know, on the home end with the remote, keeping an eye on on, you know, our students when they're home to make sure that, you know, you're really encouraging them to stick to the structures and the schedules that, um, that we're trying to, to make sure that everybody has access to for consistency and for good learning. Excellent. This one deals with attendance. The next question, are students allowed non-COVID related sick days? So traditional sick days, I would say, like we've had in the past. And, um, if not, or are they expected to attend virtually if they're sick? That's a really good question. I mean, listen, if you're sick, you should, you should do what you need to to take care of yourself, right? I, mean, I think that's an important thing. So whether that's COVID related or not COVID related, um, just like at any point in time in the, in, in the past and certainly moving forward, you know, if a student needs to take a sick day, they should take a sick day. I guess the added bonus to like where we're headed at this point in time, is that if you do take a sick day, you do actually have a better remote access to continued instruction than you might have in the past. So I, I think that will help to maintain continuity, you know, with regards to um, being home for a day or two uh, when you need to for, you know, not feeling well. But no, absolutely, students should take care of themselves, um, you know, take advantage of the resources that are available to keep instruction, um, you know, moving forward. And yeah, number one is take care of yourself. So yeah, please do. <laughs> this is important. <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Um, what about kids with different last names that live in the same household? Has that been taken into consideration? That one has not come up. No, I mean, uh, perfectly. <laughs> I gotta say, I haven't I, heard that yet. <laughs> no, I, you know, and I feel like I need to say this in in this forum. Um, we have received an immense number of. Um, requests for like variances to the alphabet delineation um, for attendance days and which days people are, are attending and not attending. Um, and we received them to the extent to the extent that we are 99% sure that we really can't honor those all. So we really are going to have to kind of stick with the letter cohorts that we have. Um, because the number of variances take apart the entire program that we're trying to balance and, and, and to keep in a, in a stable and safe way for our students moving forward. That said, um, if there are individuals with a specific issue in a, in a household, I would say that whether it be in the middle school or at the high school, you should reach out to us and make sure that we know about that. Um, that has not come up. But thank you for asking. That was good to... It's a Bring very good attention. question. Yep. I've heard a lot of questions in the past, you know, week and a half. That that variance of that question has not come up. 
<laughs> the next couple deal with accountability, grading, things of that nature. So the first question is, will parents have access to the Google Classroom pages so they can help monitor their child's progress? And I like that you stopped because, right, you want yep. me to do just one question at a time, which is good. Um, yeah, I think one of the big upgrades here is that one of the things we learned um, in the spring was that, the, that we needed to have better consistency of the use of um, a particular platform that we use for the virtual or the remote learning um, modality of our program. So as we do move into this year, we are expecting that all of our teachers at the high school will be using Google Classroom as their primary platform for remote instruction. So parents will have access to those Google Classrooms so that they can continue to monitor students' progress. Absolutely. Right, and the second part would be, will regular grading be in effect this year? Yes, yes, that's a great question. Regular grading will be back in effect. Um, you know, one of the things that really pulled us away from traditional numeric grading practices in the spring was that we had um, very little structure. We had very little continuity or consistency in how um, students were accessing instruction and what instruction looked like across the entirety of the program. Um, it was not equitable. It was not um, really fair in any way, shape, or form to use traditional grading in a structure that was just completely taken apart. As we move into this fall, um, you know, we have built structures and systems that will allow us to really consistently deliver um, instruction to all of our students in high quality ways and students access to that instruction will be more equitable and more consistent than it was. So we are going to move back to using traditional grades, traditional um, systemic accountability in that sense. Um, so traditional grades numerically are, are, are back as we move into the fall. And the third one that came in along the same lines is, are kids going to need to sign in on each remote day in order to get credit? Yes, that's a great question. It's something that Mrs. Mean, you know, we talked about extensively today. Yes, we are developing um, mechanisms as we speak. Student attendance both days, both on the hybrid day, or I'm sorry, on the in-person day and on the remote day, um, student attendance will be taken. Um, so students will have a particular electronic platform that they need to check into each morning when they are on the remote end of things in order to indicate that they have started their school day. So we will take daily attendance for students um, both on the days that they're home and in remote and both on the, on the day that they're in school as well. Excellent. And goes back to where we first started, Mr. Keeles. We got about eight minutes left. I wanted are we, to- are we, are we, we're, we are going back to those the, the, the singleton courses, right? No, the COVID. <laughs> okay, that's fair. So, that's fair. The, yeah. the, thing that the, I'm the initial about, first question was about, uh, let's say, if a kid was sent home, the attendance piece and all of that. So this one is protocols. If a student is sent home or is sick for just a regular illness, flu, sinus infection, whatever, do they need a note to prove that it's non-COVID for when they return? That was on the news today. I just saw that on the news, like literally, <laughs> literally 20 minutes before so what we started. are those started. protocols? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I do, I'm going to say that I, right now I would want to say, I've got to say I'm not exactly sure yet. I would really want to um, get more information from our nurses. Um, I want to make sure that we're talking to our nursing staff. Um, I think there's a lot of variety in how that situation can look. Um, and I'm not sure yet what our protocol will be. Um, so we'll need to check in with our nursing folks and get back to folks on that one. It's timely that you brought it up because I heard a story on the news about the same exact thing. And I was thinking to myself, that's something we need to be thinking about too. So thanks for asking the question. And maybe someone was watching the same news station as I was. Damn, because they were all <laughs> back to back, to, yes. all on that same, same vein, yes. as well as if a student is sent home sick from our nurses with one of the markers that present as possible COVID, would a student have to be tested for COVID before they could return to school? Right. I'm going to say that I don't know the answer to that yet either. Um, I definitely want to be careful about how we answer that. So that's a going to, that, that's a, we're going to get more information on that from our nursing staff. I think that'll be important. 
Uh, another question totally unrelated to that is, can supply lists be posted online by teachers or classes, especially once schedules are released so they have time to get online ordering and delivery of materials and supplies if they don't want to go out to get them? Yeah, the protocol at the high school has typically been that um, our teachers provide students with the syllabus for each of their courses on the first day of instruction. And in that syllabus, um, there is a list of the materials the students need. Um, very much unlike perhaps some of the, the, the lower grade levels, um, our teachers give students plenty of time after that first day of school to get together the materials that they need. Um, so again, for us, what will happen is, um, you know, folks will go to their first class, they'll get a syllabus from their teacher, that syllabus will tell you what you need, and you'll be given plenty of time to go out and get, get those materials or to have them, you know, shipped to your home as well. Um, just keep in mind, because I know we get that question all the time, um, you know, with the high school, there's, there are so many trajectories that a student's schedule could take that, um, you know, the class lists, uh, there, there would probably be, uh, the, the supply list, would, eh, I'm looking at the schedule board, it would be like 400 of them. So we let each teacher give those syllabus out to each of their students on the first day. And this goes back to the hybrid model itself. Will students have the same teacher for a class during their in-person day as their virtual remote day? So will they have the same teacher across the in and out schedule? In the hybrid model, absolutely, right. yes. Yep, so you will be in the same section with the same group of people. And we've also put a good deal of time into thinking about how we're gonna build community between the two separate groups. So, you know, in theory, you're attending class with people with your last name cohort in person, but there's a whole other half to the class that, you know, also is in that same section. So, you know, yes, you'll have the same teacher on both days, and we'll be working to really integrate both of those cohorts into a cohesive community in virtual ways so that you're really all still classmates. And this goes back to an earlier question, but it's from a different individual. So who would they contact about children that have different last names, but live in the same household just so that that's Yeah, no, that's sense. absolutely fair. If that's, I, it, reach out to me, please. Again, that's just not a situation that's come up. So I definitely want to be able to take a look at that and address it. Just reach out to me. Excellent. All right, let's see. Transportation question. So you may or may not be able to do this. We don't have that mark with us. Mr. Primo's not here. <laughs> but uh, as students that live in the same household, it's understood that they could share a seat, but are they going to be forced to? because sometimes siblings don't always get along with one another. That, that you're right, that has been a moving target of discussion. I think it would best be answered by Mark, uh, Mr. Primo Mark at, at this point, yep. that's our <laughs> transportation director. I need to defer to him on that. <laughs> this one is also possibly a different administrator that would deal with that possibly building and grounds. Um, have the ventilation systems been reviewed and outside air rates and filtration levels been increased? So air quality questions. With I want to say that I know that they've, they, they've put a great deal of, of work into reviewing all of our systems and our air quality. Um, you know, again, I think the best, like you had mentioned, the best person to answer that with a great deal of detail is probably our building and grounds director. Um, but you know, what I've witnessed is an awful lot of work over the course of the summer on all of our systems and ventilation and, and making sure that we're ready and that we're aligned with the regulations that we, we need to comply with. Um, but we would want Mr. Hefner to share more. <laughs> Excellent. And we are on our final two minutes, so I am going to tell you this isn't a question, but a person just put in my last one down here. Thank you for making this night happen so we can make an informed decision for our kids. Y'all are the best. So with that, I will let you close yeah. out the evening. Mr. No, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody um, who's attended. I can see the numbers kind of going up and down um, throughout the course of the session. And, um, and Mrs. Mean, I can't see the questions. Um, she's kind of just sharing them with me um, so that I can kind of focus on, on chatting with folks. So thank you to everybody for taking the time. Um, you know, I know that this is a difficult decision. This has certainly been a very challenging six or seven months that we've all been in together. 
Um, so, you know, my objective tonight was to hopefully answer things um, in such a way that you could make an informed decision about what's best for your family as you move into the upcoming year. Um, I do, you know, apologize that there is so much um, ambiguity around, uh, you know, how we're going to deliver the virtual component of a 100%, you know, virtual program for students. But again, it's that directionality of just, um, we need to know how many of you there are so that we can really appropriately plan that. So I do appreciate everybody's patience um, and understanding that we're going to just keep working together um, to build the best program that we can for each and every one of our kids. Um, and so, you know, just keep in mind that we have a web page um, on the district website that is dedicated to COVID and to reopening resources. Um, all of our forums that have, have happened are up, they're there, they're recorded. Um, and if you have any questions, please just reach out um, to the high school if it's specific to your child or their program, um, or certainly to the district to reopen um, email if it's just more general. Um, we're here to help. So um, thank you to everybody for taking the time. Let's remember that we're in this together. Um, you know, this is new for all of us, and I am looking forward to re-engaging with everybody in the new school year. And I think it will be a, a tremendous adventure and we will learn a great deal together as a community. So everybody please be well and stay healthy. Take care.